So I'm excited today because we're going to be reviewing this TrueNAS X10 box. Now I'm breaking the video up into two parts. This is going to be all about what TrueNAS is, how it differs from FreeNAS, the hardware that is the X10 system, and some of the unique features that it has. And it, they go together hand in hand. So let's say you want to build a free NAS box. There's plenty of guides that I've talked about this before. And there's, you know, you can use it on consumer hardware, enterprise hardware. It's very diverse. Uh, it works on a lot of different platforms. But true NAS is, along with this box here, is IX Systems. Got the shirt on today. They completely designed the hardware and the software together. So true NAS is a not a fork of free NAS. It is a taking the best enterprise level features that are designed for the enterprise market, which was this box is, and integrating them into this. So it gets developed alongside free NAS. They look at the highest availability parts, the most reliable parts of free NAS, such as the ZFS file system and other features that are in it. And of course the interface, a lot of us are familiar with with free NAS and integrate them in here. They don't integrate some of the things like, you know, the Plex plugin, because not as likely that you're going to be running Plex on this in the enterprise market. It's generally designed for high availability and redundant storage. But nonetheless, we're going to get into some of the details here, how the hardware works. Now, this has dual motherboards and dual power supplies. And the motherboards are part of the genius of the way they did this. So they have two completely separate modules here. We're going to open them up and show you how this looks. And what it does is this is for failover. Now what's even more magical is how they've got both motherboards simultaneously talking to all the SATA drives. I'm sorry, not SATA, SAS drives that are in here. So you have a row of SAS drives in here and both motherboards can see them at the same time and synchronize with each other. So this is a really neat feature of the way this is designed. So let's spin the box around and we'll start at the back and work our way to the front. The front's obviously pretty simple is where the drives go, but let's start at the back and show you where some of the magic is on this. All right, so we got the box spun around and let's do a quick rundown of the ports. Now, module A, module B, they're completely symmetrical. So we have two standard gigabit ports, two USBs, one installed with free NAS, I'm sorry, true NAS, but this is the installer, not the one it runs off of. So you can run free NAS off of a USB, and that's how a lot of people do it. Matter of fact, it'll even support redundant USBs, but what they've done here is they have the in installer, and then inside here, when I show you inside, they have it running on a uh, M2 SATA. So. We have the two USBs here. This is the out of band management port. So this for out of band management kind of looks like a headphone jack. And so this connects to here and then here is the dedicated out of band port. And once again, it's symmetrical. So you have this on both sides. Then we have your SAS externals. So if you wanted to use this as the head end and then plug in more drives, and once again, symmetrical over here, then you can connect to more drives. So this can be the head end, then you have several more boxes underneath of it with piles of hard drives inside of them. And that's the configuration support about this. Uh, dual expansion boxes are supported on this model. I believe some of the higher end models have even more expansion beyond that. So they shipped it to us with two RJ45 10 gigabit ports in here. Uh, this is your low profile card. It's essentially a PCIe. They have other configuration options you can get it with such as SFP+. So once again, contact your rep and they can get you the right ones. Now, the hardware itself is really nicely put together. And also, if you don't wanna use out of band over IP, the IPMI, they have a little spot right here where you can plug in a headphone jack. And they give you a headphone jack with a USB on it. So this is so you can do your own console, so you can plug into here and it's pretty long, I think it's a four foot, five foot cable here. But if you didn't want to do IPMI for some reason, this was in the box as well. Back to the hardware, really easy to get to everything except one minor annoyance. If you're using cables that are like this with a little boot and a stopper right here so they don't eject easy, I can get to the bottom of these fine, but on IPMI, my finger doesn't fit under here real well. I mean, it's a pretty minor complaint. You can wiggle it out. Uh, 
but you know, I guess I gotta find something wrong. So I'm so happy with it overall. That's my uh, one complaint I have is it's a little hard to get the network jack out of here. But the reality is once you install these in your data center, you're not likely to be pulling the network cables out all day, but uh, just note you do that. Now, it's because of the way this is recessed over and when you pull it out, it's actually easy to get out too. So generally, once you plug these in, like I said, you're not unplugging and replugging. Now let's start with the power supply though about how it comes apart. So you got this little orange lever here and we give it a push to release it. And just as smooth as can be, power supply will slide right out. And they've got it well fitted. So the power supply also contains the fans for airflow. We have this here. So we have air coming in through the front and then air coming in across the top here to create the airflow. And that actually goes in to pull the airflow through the motherboard. The power supply has got nice guides on it. Really just, it's heavy and uh, efficient. So the, these are uh, well rated, you know, with modern equipment, you really want efficiency because, well, electricity is, you know, not a cheap thing. It's a big expense at the data centers. Bandwidth and electricity. So it slips in really nice. So when you're pushing it in, you can't just push the whole unit in. There's a stopper, it hits right here. And what that stopper does is keep you from just jamming it in wrong and then you slowly lever it up and fits in nice, snug, secure, and clicks and locks so you can't accidentally remove the power supply. Now on to the motherboard. This is really cool too. Lift the lever. I mean, you could pull and you see it pushes on this lever a little bit, but you lift this lever and pull these and it gently slides out the motherboard. And away it comes out. Now, back to the venting you've seen on the power supply. There's the venting here, so the air comes through and pulls down, and this right here prevents the air from getting pulled back in, so it keeps nice directional airflow coming through the unit. The hardware on this, I mean, this is well engineered. It fits really well. These little clips here, these aren't plastic or chintzy at all. This is really solid. This is metal. And so they have nice, they have stops, so they won't go too far, so when you pull them out, you don't have to try and find the sweet spot to slide this back in. They come, they hit, they grab these little notches on each either side, and it pulls it in the rest of the way. And here's the connectors on the other side. So once again, metal guide here. Then all the connectors to connect all the bus and everything else. Also, let's slide this out of the way. The design itself is toolless. So to perform any upgrade functions, press these two blue buttons like magic, we're in inside the board itself. On the turn side, we have your standard memory here. We have our PCI card for the extra add-in for networks. So obviously it's, you know, uh, PCIe, so it's easy enough to, you know, find other adapters for this. I mean, they're gonna ship you with what you want, but it's interchangeable, so that if something goes wrong with this card, uh, they'll probably just send you a whole new module, but it's modular itself. We have the Intel processor under here. This unit shipped with an Intel 1531 at 2.2 gigahertz. So plenty of power if you're using uh, this for encryption or anything else, which I highly recommend using encrypted arrays. That way when arrays go bad, you don't have to worry about the data on them. Also, if you can look down in here, and I'm not gonna remove anything, I'm just demoing the hardware, but right there we have an M2 SATA SanDisk 128. That's actually what this boots off of, is the SanDisk and runs. Now they have the USB in here, I believe just to reload it. So it's probably got a copy of the operating system on there. And then this is actually what it boots off of. So you have a nice solid boot device inside of here. That's pretty much the hardware inside here. Really nicely designed, really clean. And I like that it's just tool, it's just simple, click, and you're done. And we slide it back in. It clicks and you're back in business. It's really impressive to me how they've done the interconnects between these because both of them can see all the hard drives all the time for the high availability. So you have this, even if this fails and you have to get a replacement module, there's not downtime to replace it. It is made to be pulled out. I was told you can pull them out live and it's not obviously recommended, it's for emergency situations. Because of the amperage these use, you could scar up the terminals if you did this frequently. And uh, hopefully with most time, you know, generally hardware doesn't fail that often. These are all the just in case scenarios. So let's spin it around and take a look at the hard drives. So here's the drives in them, and they're standard 
nice trays to slide out. Now the trays are not toolless. There are screws holding the drives in. But this is actually a preferred method because you want that precision. And some of the toolless ones are cool, but I've had to fiddle with them a little. Like you put them in and you fiddle with the drive and then it goes in. Because they've got these on the side here, the little tension clips, so when these drives go in, they're perfect. There's no fiddling or moving them around. Now over here, we've got SSDs in here. So here's the tray for the uh, SSDs, and these are gonna be for part of the testing we're doing. We'll show you how you can set up a cache and a zill on these. But this for the SSDs, the tray's slightly different uh, to accommodate. So the trays themselves are not universal. And if you have blanks, like you don't have a hard drive in here to keep the airflow universal, uh, you end up with a standard blank one, which no holder for hard drive on it. But that's so if you took one of these drives out or if you have a unit that you didn't order with all the drives filled, they're gonna come fill them with blanks that look just like the other ones and you have that on there. So you also have a little writing tab right here so you can maybe put coordinates or information on there. Also right here, uh, they, these ones, because they shipped them in separate boxes, these ones all just say HDD on them, but then there's a spot here so we can see and put you know little stickers inside of here and that's what these are is actually little sticker spots so pretty slick pretty clean looking interface on there uh, plus they have the rows labeled 0347811 because the unit can tell you which drive it is and cross-reference that and then we have the lights over here on the side which it has a light to let you know if there's a problem and a green light to let you know that it's on now they also do ship these with rails and everything else so you can mount this and have it on a rail system that slides in and out that's also another option it comes with all right so let's get this thing powered on and i know a question people ask is how loud is it now ideally these are going to be in a data center probably not sitting next to your desk but on you know you may have concerns of just how loud and the really concern is how many watts does it use so i have the trusty kilowatt now they rated their power supplies on the spec sheet they said they are 90 percent efficient I believe it because this thing actually doesn't pull a ton of watts for how much, how many hard drives and uh, the build of the machine. So let's get it plugged in. I'm going to leave the microphone exactly how it is so you can hear how loud it is and we'll talk about how many watts it's using. So we started out uh, 140 watts, we just hit 300 watts for the spin up, which you heard. And now we're coming all the way down to 220 watts as it's booting up. So it's kind of settled on about 220 right now. And we've left this plugged in before when we were doing some setup testing with it. And it seems to stay in the couple hundred watt range. Obviously, a lot of the wattage is pulled by the hard drives up here. CPUs idle fairly efficiently and when they're not under high load, high use, but yeah, it's not pulling a ton of watts right now, so it's it's pretty reasonable on power. Uh, maybe we'll do some testing when we put it under load to see how much that goes up when we're loading it up. Uh, but I don't think you're going to see a dramatic change between them in the in the wattage for this, other than when it's under full load. With uh, if you, these are not 15k drives, but if you went all the way up to like 15k drives, they generally pull more wattage. So you're going to see some of that. Actually, it's now the should be checking the drives. I can't see if they're starting to blink or not. It just jumped up to like 260 watts. Enough about the power. It's not the most fascinating thing about this, but it's good to know that they've put some time into making very efficient power supplies on these. Uh, another side note, even with these drives running and all that, not a lot of heat. It does not, uh, it's not like sitting behind some of the other servers. So we have an older server that we, for one of our clients, it's like a blow dryer behind it all the time. <laughs> some of the older ones are very inefficient and uh, they dissipate a lot of heat. This is obviously really modern hardware, so uh, thermal concerns have been addressed in it. Okay, so we talked about all the hardware and let's talk about what's different about the software. Now, TrueNAS versus FreeNAS. As I said, this is a very optimized version of FreeNAS specifically for the hardware. So you have the people engineering the hardware working hand in hand with the people designing this particular flavor of FreeNAS. Now here's my FreeNAS machine. Here's TrueNAS. FreeNAS, TrueNAS. Logo's different. A couple more options over here. We're gonna talk about that. So it really has that familiar interface. So we go to storage. I have a storage pool set here. We go to my storage. I have a lot more storage pools, but you get this idea. They're very much the same as far as most of your functionality. So if you are used to using FreeNAS, 
True NAS is really not much of a learning curve, but there's a few extra things in here. So let's first talk about True NAS being that it's enterprise designed with the enterprise if you work in that level, you want really good support, not just uptime. Uptime is a really big factor in deciding hardware, but so is having support. And this is something pretty cool that they've built in. So before we get all the HA stuff, we'll run across some of these tools here. Tunables, they come pre-tuned. This is something that you're gonna get from the TrueNAS people. They enable the auto-tune, because they understand the hardware very, very well and can optimize it specifically for the configurations that you're getting shipped. So when you order it, they build it, they ship it, it's all configured. Now, a couple of notes here. They do not ship it in HA mode. I guess you could ask them to if you wanted to, if you gave them the very specifics about your network. But the way they shipped it to me was they shipped it to me, I got it on the network, and then one of their technicians, because you get a technician with us, doesn't come in a box, but it'll do remote support and help you. You get one of their engineers to set this up. So they were amazing. I spent some time on the phone with them, doing a lot of Q&A and learning some of the details because I was, you know, want to dive in deep behind the scenes with this. So I wanted to understand how it was working so I could share that with you. So it shipped without HA and I got to watch the HA process. Now they like to help you with HA. That's part of the package. And please let them help you because uh, you can make mistakes when you're doing this and uh, put the machine in a non-bootable mode, essentially. The storage, all that looks much the same, but these have a couple different options. So we have the tunables and then we have over here, the failover, which is sync from peer, sync to peer, save, set your timeout options. These are to give some expanded options for your timeout between the two boards for failovers. Uh, the defaults seem to work fine, but they do have a couple clients with some really unique special use cases. This is a really cool thing here. And that enable automatic alerts to IAC system. And it's just a checkbox based on the support level you have. That's pretty cool. And the reason this is nice is because yes, you still get your notices here and you can still have an email you notices and all of the usual things that you have with free NAS plus the proactive support. And this they told me, I said, how does it work in production is always how I like to ask things. And they said, well, we've actually called clients numerous times because you know, as IT people may have job hopped or changed, the notice goes to an email address that someone didn't notice or uh, Bob is who got it before and now Sally has the job and Bob's email address is dead. So then they don't get the notice when the problem occurs. When you have this enabled, they don't, they get the notice. And when they get the notice, they're like, hey, drive XYZ failed and uh, we're ready to ship you out another one. So the, this proactive support, if you don't have IT people that are checking their emails and things like that, they can get everything ready. It automatically opens a ticket and they contact you and they're ready for the replacement. So if you are on vacation as an IT guy, they're still working behind the scenes to help you. And this is a really cool feature for these proactive support. And so their engineers have information on it. Uh, as I said before, it's this Intel Xeon CPUD. Now, here's a couple things about how HA works inside of here. They're using the BSD CARP system. And by doing that, I only ever have to change everything on this one virtual IP. And I see virtual IP. This is the IP that you want to attach all your shares to, the IP essentially for the system. But the way CARP works, there's more than one. Now, you don't require any special networking hardware to have CARP working. So here's .245. Here is 247. These are the individual nodes themselves. And anything I change here or here, because this is the active node, which is why I can see it, automatically syncs over to the inactive node because they use standby mode for HA. So the two are powered up, but it's only in, so to speak, a read-only standby mode. So it tells you the active IP, it tells you that it's on standby, it tells you HA is enabled here. So everything's ready. This thing is ready to fly, but, it's not active. And what happens is if this node goes down, dot 245, it right now at about six second intervals, it's checking. So if this node's not up, it immediately jumps over to the other node. Now, side note, if something goes really wrong in here, they also will force the kernel panic to shut this one down and move to the other one. It used to remind me of the, I, I think we used to pronounce it uh, Stonith, S-T-O-N-I-F, uh, shoot the other node in the head, which was from Beowulf clusters uh, in the earlier days of Linux, uh, HA, which was how you got rid of a rogue one. You would just shoot it in the head as they used to say. So I always thought that was kind of funny.
And that's with this, uh, with the networking and everything else, it's watching for the network and the interfaces and determining whether or not this node needs to be up or if this node needs to be up. So it's constantly checking. But effectively, you just do everything at one IP address and you don't have to know. Now you're gonna get a notice if one of the nodes goes down. Uh, you just aren't gonna experience any downtime, which of course is the ultimate goal. So each one of these machines are sitting here. Now, what about doing updates? That's interesting. I was asking about that. And when you do the system updates first, this the updates for this are not as frequent as they are for freelance. They're very strongly tested. They are very much more focused and only the enterprise level stuff. So they're really highly focused on stability. And the nice thing is when you're doing an update for this, because it's their hardware, they have you know, each one of these engineers are, have one of these in their lab, so they're testing everything thoroughly before they send you the update. So you don't have to worry about, oh, no, no, will this update break anything I have because of some unique hardware configuration? They do the testing internally for that. But the updates work the same as they do, but because you're running dual nodes, when you run the update, I'm actually updating the other node, not this one. And then vice versa, it's gonna switch back and forth between them. And so you update each node, it comes up and then, you can do the switchovers. So you can update with zero downtime. And I think that's kind of neat. If an update goes awry, you'd only end up with uh, one node down. And so you could work on a solution to that versus you know taking the system down because of an update. So I kind of like the way they did that, the way it automatically does that. So another question may came up, might come up, and this is uh, something I found really clever as well. So this HA journal file that's under the data folder is actually a journal of any changes you may make while the other node is rebooting. So if I forced a node failure and then also while that node is in fail mode but rebooting, it creates a journal of any changes to shares, the storage controller, anything you're changing inside of TrueNAS. And what it's doing is getting ready to sync that. So as soon as the other node comes up, it goes, here's all the changes and sync them. That's what keeps the nodes in sync. Now that's also, if for some reason that doesn't work, why they have this failover option where you can force the syncing going back the other way if you needed to. Uh, I haven't done too much other than the general plugging, unplugging stuff. We're gonna do a whole separate video showing the redundancy of this, uh, but I've never had to use the actual sync one and I have simulated some changes. And like I said, when we get into the uh, failure mode reviews of this as a separate video, I'll show you how that works. But uh, novel the way they did it. Now, another thing you may notice here is I wonder how they talk to each other. Well, I know it's a lot just dumped on the screen right here, but I'll highlight the part that's interesting. This is a network card the that main, you don't see. So NTB, so you have your IX and IGBs over here. So we're gonna go over to networking interfaces and there's those, but what you don't have is the other one here that I'm showing because what these are, and we did some speed tests between here, uh, the NTB is a bus network for CARP. So it's actually not using to synchronize the two systems. It's not using the interfaces that are on the back of it. It has another internal interface for the two nodes to talk to each other. This is rather clever and we did some speed testing and it's like a 40 gigabit link between there. So it's really impressive just how much speed we got doing speed tests with iperf between there. And so that's how fast it can sync back and forth. And this is also uh, for handing off when a node fails, it can hand off to the other node or especially when you're doing a controlled like an update, and you're handing off to the other node. This is part of what makes that so fast and allows these both these controllers to stay in sync with all of the drives at once. This is how the nodes talk to each other on the back end. And I guess that's really important because you don't want the network interfaces in the back to be cluttered up with any of the management inter, uh, CARP information that has to go back and forth between them. So this is its this comes pre-configured with the uh, units. This is how the units, the sums talk to each other. So let's get on to some of the other differences. Now you probably noticed, let's go back over to my free NAS box. So go here is, there are jails I have in mind still from doing the upgrade. There's a plugins option so we can plug in things. And like I said, you are missing some of that here. You don't get all the plugins. Jails are not currently on the feature set that this has. Uh, maybe it's something they'll add in the future, but it's nothing they have right now. Generally in the enterprise market, I mean, this is a dedicated part of your storage SAN in the back in your server office, not something that you wanna run Plex on or a bunch of other plugins. 
But when it comes to services, for example, most of those are all the same. DNS, domain controller, iSCSI, LDAP, rsync, uh, still has S3 storage on here. So you can have some of the Amazon features. SMB, SMP, SS, SSH, web dev, uh, and UPS controls and the services. And the sharing is iSCSI, Windows, web dev, Unix, Apple. So you have the same feature sets there in terms of all the file functionality in TrueNAS, just like you have in FreeNAS. The Active Directory services, and as you can see, look the same between TrueNAS and FreeNAS. So you still have the same functionality in there. I also thought it was cool they left the wizard in both of them. So you still have the uh, setup wizard. Uh, the setup wizard doesn't cover HA. I was curious if it did, it did not. So that still was the call to a tech to get that done. Now, another thing they have is the vCenter plugin. This is something rather new and it's not fully developed. They've thrown it in here and seen how many of their clients really want to use it and they're going to do further development on it. But what this actually will allow you to do is use vCenter to work directly with it. So you can actually create the drives inside of vCenter instead of logging into the TrueNAS box and it will create the drives for you. I believe it creates the uh, iSCSI uh, LUNs for that. I'm not an expert because I don't run any of the ESX uh, things, so I'm not a vCenter expert, but they said this is something they're working on developing. They have it as a can create but cannot destroy drives, which is probably good that way if anything goes wrong with the interface, but this is an active plugin that they're working on that does come in here. Now, side note about TrueNAS, it has also been certified to work with both ESX, Microsoft Hyper-V, and Citrix N server. So they have done testing. They did say the majority of their clients are running ESXi with this in the back end, but they've done testing with these. So once again, when they take out of the code from FreeNAS, they focus on these enterprise features. And I believe they got some certifications that they've went through with these companies to make sure this. They also are really good at support because they're supporting so many other companies. If you're using one of those configurations, they're really helpful at getting, at helping you get that set up. And of course, like I said, uh, ESX being king and dominant of the virtualization world, they're really familiar with uh, that particular system. And these are a really popular solution. They have clients with petabytes of storage with these and you know, no problems, they work really well and it's a popular piece of hardware. So I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the TrueNAS and kind of show you the difference between the TrueNAS and the FreeNAS and a review of this TrueNAS X10 hardware. Uh, the separate video is going to be us actually showing this in action. So I can tell you all these cool HA features, but uh, we'll do separate videos that are just on showing how resilient this system is and tolerant to faults as in removing power supplies or even a node coming out of it while it's on and you know making sure the failover works and having machines attached to it so we can actually see the entire mode. So if you like the content here, like, and subscribe. Uh, if you have certain questions, post them in the comments below. And also if you have uh, some specific things you want me to test on this, I'm more than happy. Uh, you guys help inspire me to do some of these videos and give me suggestions for things you want to see or, or questions and concerns. And we've got this thing for a little bit longer and we're going to be doing some of those tests. All right. Thanks. Like the content here, like, and subscribe. I appreciate it.